1930s, the Depression years. But for the Mafia, the takings had seldom seen better. The end of prohibition had meant the end of bootlegging and the end of the easy money that had helped the criminal world become organized. The Mafia had shown all the skill of a modern corporation. They had diversified. They now made money from the legal liquor trade. They had taken over New York's docks. Little went on there without their approval. They controlled the nightclubs. They were behind prostitution. And they were moving into gambling in a big way. For them, it was an era of prosperity. These were particularly good times for gang leader Lucky Luciano. He had killed his rivals and was now the Mafia kingpin. He estimated that his numerous enterprises were turning over about two billion dollars a year. He had also developed a close working relationship with Meyer Lansky, a Jewish mobster with exceptional financial skills. Their relationship would prove a critical partnership in the history of the mob. One guy who knew them both said that they related so closely, it was like they were lovers. They would complete each other's sentences. There was some sort of unspoken rapport between them. I'm not suggesting that Lansky and Luciano had sex, but they did have an extraordinary connection. Lansky and Luciano had grown up together on the Lower East Side, and at an early age, had learned to make money out of street gambling, such as dice games. Gambling was in their blood. In the 1930s, if you were anyone, you knew where to go to gamble. For one month every year in the crazy dog days of August, New York's gamblers boarded the train at Grand Central Station and made the picturesque ride four hours up the Hudson. Their destination? The small town of Saratoga Springs. Every year, but just in August, thanks to the presence of its racetrack, Saratoga became the gambling capital of America. It was a society scene, and houses in the town could be rented out for as much as $5,000 per month. The town's population swelled from some 13,000 people to over 45,000. Saratoga attracted society families, the Whitneys and the Vanderbilts, it was also a beacon for the Lucianos, the Lanskys, and the Costellos. Saratoga was big money. In one month, the town did three million dollars worth of business. Much of the money exchanged hands at the racetrack, but when the betting ended on the horses, it was by no means the end of the day for Saratoga's gamblers. They closed at six o'clock in the evening because that's when the races ended. And then the next opening was the lake houses but that wouldn't get busy out there until probably 9 or 10 o'clock or even later. But they had to eat and they had great food out there. The, the gamblers would come to the movies and they'd go into the movies and uh, they'd stay for an hour. They would tell the usher in an hour, let me get out of here. They didn't care whether the movie was just beginning or halfway through, that meant nothing. They were just occupying time. When they left the movies, the gamblers would go out to Lake Saratoga. There. Around the edge of the waters were the lake houses, full of music, good food, and roulette wheels. One of the best known was Piping Rock, where Lansky had an interest. Piping Rock probably was the most glamorous looking on the outside and also on the inside. They gave you a very good dinner. They gave you wonderful floor shows. Sophie Tucker, I can still see her in a red velvet dress belting out Red Hot Mama, and she could. The main owners of Piping Rock were Joe Adonis, who had given himself the name Adonis because he thought he was so good looking, and Frank Costello. It was here that the gangsters developed their ideas for the making of a successful casino. It was the model for Las Vegas. The food, the drink, and the entertainment all had to be good enough for people, especially wives and girlfriends, wouldn't stay long enough to lose their money. And the place had to be run honestly, because there was nothing like the bad smell of a fixed bet to send other gamblers running. Few people knew, or at least admitted to knowing, about the Mafia's presence. Nobody stopped them, let's put it that way. Uh, you couldn't say that people didn't know there was gambling here. Everybody wanted to know or got their eyes open knew there was gambling here. 
but uh, it was tolerated. It was in everyone's interest to go along with the game. The town made just too much money. The beauty of gambling is that it is seen as a fairly benign criminal activity. It doesn't kill anybody. The victims are willing. It is one of the so-called victimless crimes. So there's usually not a great hue and cry about abolishing it. The mob can control gambling and not have to worry too much about cops. In Saratoga, the police even helped transport money from the casinos to the banks, although they would also stage periodic raids so that no one would accuse them of corruption. But every once in a while, you get a local person who, you know, thought, well, this isn't right. And, and it was always nice if there were questions, say, well, we raided that place at such and such a date. We raided this place on such and such a date. So you were, really Some make, authority. You were making an effort. Saratoga was good to the gangsters, but it was just the beginning. Meyer Lansky was thinking bigger. Lansky was always pushing them to expand. He was much smarter than most gangsters. He had broader horizons. He read a book occasionally. He belonged to the Book of the Month Club. He was reasonably literate for a gangster. So his, his world was wider, and he had a certain entrepreneurial vision. In the late 1930s, Lansky's vision extended to Cuba. Crime buster Thomas Dewey had made it difficult to run gambling dens in New York. Lansky saw in Cuba a golden opportunity. It's a corrupt place. It's run by Batista, an utterly corrupt and corruptible dictator with flexible ethical standards, shall we say. And so he sees the opportunity. It's very close to Florida. It's easy to get to. It's a warm weather place in the wintertime. And so he moves in there. Lansky struck a deal with Batista. He gave the dictator $3 million up front and a guarantee of $3 million a year to allow the mob to control gambling rights in Cuba. In Havana, the Mafia took over the Hotel Nacional. They opened a casino aimed at the big spenders who flocked across from the USA. Gambling was never as benign as people like to think. The stakes were big, and everyone was on the tape. Behind the spinning wheels was menace. Just as corporations have security guards, Lucky Luciano had decided that the Mafia needed an enforcement arm, an ominous group of hitmen whom the press would nickname Murder Incorporated. They would perform hits to order for all branches of the mob all over the country. Murder, Inc. was a select group of Jewish and Italian killers who were each given a retainer of $200 per week to be exclusively available to the Mafia. One of their number was Benjamin Siegel, nicknamed Bugsy, the man who years later would be credited for popularizing Las Vegas. In 1936, one of his early hits came back to haunt him. The police were closing in. Bugsy's cohort suggested he get out of town, go to California. For Siegel, it was a promotion of sorts, from the activities of Murder Incorporated to more cerebral rackets activities. Nicky Cohen, who arrived about the same time in the early 1930s, later said that Siegel was sent because things were not organized in Los Angeles. The head of the Mafia family there, Jack Dragna, simply had not pulled things together. And once there, he, he goes Hollywood. He starts to think of himself as an actor and a man around town, and wants to be an actor, starts dressing like an actor, hangs out with people like George Raft. Raft was a, an actor who wanted to be a gangster, and Siegel was a gangster who wanted to be an actor, so they had common ground. Siegel is fascinated by Hollywood, and even went so far as to have a screen test. But his leading role remains mobster. Extortion rackets were his specialty. He muscled into the Screen Extras Guild, gaining control of the extras, and then threatened to halt movie filming unless big-name stars gave him so-called loans, loans that averaged about $10,000 apiece. It was a racket that earned Siegel as much as $400,000 a year. 
As his business grew, he built a 35-room mansion in the Holmby Hills section of Los Angeles. It was testimony to not only the success of his extortion rackets, but also his success in looking after the mob's interest in bookmaking and gambling on the West Coast. But the success of gangsters like Bugsy Siegel, Meyer Lansky, and Lucky Luciano was attracting the attention of the public. There were increasing calls for a law and order clampdown. Is everything set? We've got a full list. Every gangster in the mob is being watched this minute. Any signs of leaks? They don't suspect a thing. Then it's 10 tonight. Pick up the 15 ringleaders first. Here are the sealed orders for the men. With crack New York detectives, Dewey's roundup was skillfully directed. Mob after mob was taken by surprise. Simultaneously, all over the city, the underworld was rounded up. Henchmen couldn't turn to big shots for help because big shots fared no better. Neither money nor political connections could save a single monster. One after another, New York's most dangerous and elusive public enemies found themselves where they belonged, behind bars. On April Fool's Day, 1936, Dewey declared Lucky Luciano public enemy number one. Luciano fled to Hot Springs, Arkansas, a town which had a reputation as a resort for retired gangsters. Oney Madden, one of the biggest bootleggers in New York in the 20s, had retired to Hot Springs in the early 30s, and he was there sort of taking charge of the national mob's interests and greeting people as they left the train and so on. So it seemed like a safe place for Luciano to go and to hide out from Dewey. But Luciano was mistaken, and Dewey's agents were able to arrest him. They drove him to the railroad station and took extraordinary precautions, as befitted the capture of public enemy number one. A few years earlier, there'd been a very famous massacre in Kansas City. A gangster was being transferred from one train to another, and his friends took this opportunity to try to liberate him. And there'd been a gunfight, and cops and gangsters had been killed. It was a bloody, terrible scene. I think that was very much on the mind of Dewey's people in Hot Springs. They were afraid, uh, given who Luciano was, the biggest man in the underworld with friends all over the country, they were afraid of another ambush like that, so they put him in a railroad car and locked the doors and sped him to New York. In New York, Luciano's trial hit the newspaper headlines. There were numerous offenses he was guilty of. Murder, bootlegging, union racketeering, protection rackets, to name just a few. But on Sunday, June 7, 1936, while at the peak of his power, Luciano was convicted of what was probably one of the few crimes he did not commit, compulsory prostitution. Dewey had rounded up prostitutes all over town and found a heroin addict named Koki Flo Brown, who swore that Luciano was their boss. Luciano was known as a womanizer, Dewey told the jury about his high living at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and about the women and prostitutes who visited him there. It was enough to condemn Luciano, and he was given a 30 to 50 year prison sentence. He kept insisting on his innocence and told a prison psychiatrist, I have been in many rackets, but not in that one. He was sent to the grimmest prison in New York, Denimora, known by the Mafia as Siberia. But despite his incarceration, he continued to run the mob from his cell. He had great authority in the prison. One of the prison guards later told a story about he'd watch Luciano out in the prison yard during recreational times. And Luciano would stand there and men would line up to see him, to have an audience with the great lucky Luciano. Luciano would stand there and listen and then say yes or no. And the man would back away from him instead of turning his back to the great Luciano. While Lucky Luciano languished in prison, world events were taking a momentous turn. When Britain's Prime Minister Chamberlain signed the Munich Pact with Hitler and Mussolini, breaking up Czechoslovakia, only the optimistic believed what he had to say. Because on death turns the peace of Europe in our time. Even Chamberlain's government was insecure. It decided to send some of Britain's gold reserve to America on the French liner, the Normandy. It was this ship that would become the focus of one of the strangest wartime plots involving the Mafia and Lucky Luciano. 
In her heyday, the Normandy was the fastest and largest passenger ship in the world. Anyone who was anyone traveled on her. But by 1939, cross-Atlantic travel was losing its glamour. Although the Allies were not yet at war, people were jittery. German U-boats were at sea, and no one knew when war might break out. On August 23rd, the Normandy sailed for the last time to America. It was a tense voyage. The liner was shadowed by the German ship, the Bremen, and the captain zigzagged at high speed across the ocean, ordering the passengers to cover all windows. Days after she docked, German armored divisions swept into Poland. On September 3rd, 1939, Britain declared war. To most Americans, these events were horrific. But Lucky Luciano viewed the outbreak of war not as a catastrophe, but as an opportunity. He was particularly intrigued when on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese struck at Pearl Harbor. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. As America responded by mobilizing, the government decided to convert the Normandy into a troop carrier to be renamed Lafayette. Conversion began immediately. 2,500 workmen worked round the clock, 24 hours a day. Following the disaster at Pearl Harbor, there was increasing concern about the safety of the New York docks and of the Normandy. And there was good reason. The Germans had a history of sabotage. Earlier, one of the Normandy sister ships, Paris, had mysteriously caught fire in the French port at Le Havre. The blaze had erupted simultaneously all over the ship just before she was about to sail for New York. Luciano understood the fears of the times and wanted to exploit them to get out of prison. He summoned three friends to Denimora, including Meyer Lansky. He wanted them to use their power on the waterfront. The Mafia effectively controlled the docks. They were the personal fiefdoms of the Anastasia brothers. Albert Anastasia was one of the most feared leaders of Murder Incorporated. People called him the Mad Hatter or the Lord High Executioner. He had a hair-trigger temper and loved to kill, especially with his bare hands. His brother, Tough Tony, was vice president of the International Longshoremen's Association and head of the most powerful waterfront union in Brooklyn. There was little that went on down at the waterfront without them knowing about it. They controlled the unions, and nothing was loaded or unloaded without their knowledge and their approval. They received commissions, and they received protection money. And it wouldn't be hard for them to arrange an accident. Threats had already been made against the Normandy. This information was passed on to J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, who discovered that security was negligible. The FBI also picked up German shortwave radio signals. One said, observe Normandy. While conversions continued on the Normandy, the sense of urgency was fanned by continuing bad news from the front. But despite the state of war, security remained lax on the docks. In late January 1942, Lucky Luciano received word, while still languishing in Denimora prison, that Albert Anastasia had an idea. Why not sabotage the Normandy? Lucky later said that he told Anastasia to go ahead. Whether he did or not will never be proved. But what follows is certain. In New York's Hudson River, a five-alarm fire sweeps the former French luxury liner Normandy. On February 9th, 1942, at about 2.30 in the afternoon, a fire broke out in the lounge of the Normandy, where workers were using welding torches. Piles of life jackets caught fire, and the flames were quickly out of control. I came down Park Avenue on the school bus, and it was filled with black smoke. And it was windy and cold that day, and the smoke was just coming right across Park Avenue. And you knew there was a big fire somewhere. Didn't know what. And I got into the house, 
My mother told me that the Normandy was on fire. My father returned shortly thereafter from work, said, forget your homework, let's go see what's going on. By the time NBC started their live broadcasts, there were thousands of people there. Street vendors even set up hot dog and ice cream stands. New York's Mayor LaGuardia, who had a reputation for dashing to almost every fire in the city, raced to the scene. As fire trucks and fire boats pumped millions of gallons of water onto the ship, it soon became apparent to the more observant seamen that the greatest danger to the Normandy was capsizing from flooding. As night fell and the Normandy started to list badly, the police removed all the press from the area. Just after 2 a.m., the Normandy rolled over. It must have been the following Saturday that my father took me back to see her. That is what is so, so very vivid in my memory. Retracing our steps and coming there and just seeing this enormous gray hulk lying on the ocean bottom and um, that was devastating. The FBI investigated 760 leads and staged a reenactment of the fire at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. No signs of sabotage were discovered. It appeared to have been an accident. But in Denimora prison, Lucky Luciano thought otherwise. He was convinced that Albert Anastasia had arranged the fire, and he was sure that the government would now realize the need for mafia protection. The smoldering, lifeless hull of the Normandy symbolized the worst fears of America's intelligence agencies. Although they could not prove sabotage, the Normandy presented undeniable proof that the nation's docks were at risk. These fears were fanned by the growing spy mania in the country. G-men crack down on Nazi saboteurs. With quiet efficiency, J. Edgar Hoover's federal detectives check would-be destruction almost fantastically planned. The FBI already had conclusive evidence that there were German spies operating in New York. Using surveillance cameras, they had filmed one group exchanging secret military documents. This evidence was unsettling enough, but it was the shipping disasters along the eastern seaboard that really called for immediate action. From December of 41 through March of 42, you lose 121 ships. And these are merchant ships carrying cargo that is vital. And we don't know where the information is coming from. Are they being refueled? Are they being given information concerning these ships and their port of embarkation and debarkation as they run along the coast of the Eastern Sea frontier? Many questions we had to have answered. The Navy was by now trawling the docklands, trying to get information about possible saboteurs, but they met a wall of silence. One lieutenant said it was part of their being. They just refused to talk to anybody, war effort or no war effort. They didn't know whether it interfered with somebody who was running the pier. The Navy was desperate. Under the circumstances in which our nation was struggling for survival, any and all means which could lead to the prevention of sabotage, espionage, terrorism is warranted to apprehend those who could be a danger, or those who are a danger. And this would involve everyone, anyone, including this alleged underworld or mafia. And so began one of the strangest collaborations of the war, an uneasy marriage between the military and the mafia, codenamed Operation Underworld. Operation Underworld was so mysterious, so unlikely, you'd think it might have been made up by a fertile imagination. In March 1942, Naval Intelligence approached New York District Attorney Frank Hogan to ask for help in securing the safety of the New York waterfront. Hogan had worked with Dewey, 
and was now conducting an intensive investigation of crime on the docks. He knew that the mob controlled the waterfront and had eyes and ears everywhere. A few nights later, a secretive meeting was arranged, not far from Grant's tomb in Riverside Park. There, on a park bench, waterfront racketeer Joe Sox Lenza agreed to help naval intelligence. Sox Lenza, so named because of his heavy hitting in sandlock baseball games, had worked at the fish market since he was a teenager. The fish handlers were mainly Italian, and Sox had organized them into the Seafood Workers Union. None of the fish moved anywhere without Sox approval, and without a payment to the union's benevolent fund. Even the merchants who came to buy fish paid Sox in order to have their automobiles protected from vandalism. This was Sox's personal fiefdom, and he was the obvious person for the Navy to approach. The Navy was particularly concerned that the fishermen, some of whom were former bootleggers, might be running supplies out to German submarines. We didn't know if fishing trawlers were supplying them with diesel fuel. All we knew was that the sinkings continued, and we had to take action. Sox and his mafia friends were anxious to help. Although they were Italian, they hated Italy's wartime leader Mussolini. Mussolini in Italy in the early 20s had cracked down on the mafia there and some of the major American gangsters had come to the United States because they had been sh uh, shunted out of Sicily by Mussolini's crackdown. So when the war came, they were disposed to dislike Mussolini, most of them. And so when they were then asked to enlist in the war effort in their way, they were agreeable to it. They had another reason for helping. Sox Lanza and his friends saw the alliance as a way to free their boss, Lucky Luciano. Sox started going on a regular basis to see the intelligence officer in charge of Operation Underworld, Commander Charles Radcliffe Haffenden. Haffenden was a flamboyant officer who appeared to love the mystery and intrigue. He worked out of his own suite at the Astor Hotel rather than his official naval intelligence office. There he sat behind a big oak desk, spoke into an archaic and oversized dictaphone machine. In the beginning, the Navy used Sox Lenza as their primary source for information about the docks. Up to a point, he was very helpful through the ability to infiltrate some of our informants and agents into the Union so that there was a constant flow of information. But Lenza's contacts soon went dry. He told the Navy only one man could help them further, Lucky Luciano. Luciano was delighted when friends arrived with a naval officer to make a startling but not totally unexpected proposal. He agreed to help the war effort and the expectation that he would get a pardon when it was over. He also wanted to be transferred to a prison that was closer to his friends so they could visit him to get instructions. On May 12, 1942, Luciano was transferred to Great Meadows Prison at Comstock. In comparison with Denimora, it was considered a country club. Luciano was not supposed to receive any special treatment, but his guards noticed differently. They treated him with, uh, with respect. Uh, I remember that his ring on his finger was, was no phony. It was, a, it was a good diamond. It looked like it, because it really put your eye out. And now how come that he was allowed to wear that, and the other inmates, that when they first come in, they'd take those right on and put them in an envelope. And when they leave, they give them to him. But he was allowed to wear that big, I suppose it was a diamond. And of course, that showed the other inmates that he was something special. The prison guards knew something was up, especially when mysterious visitors started turning up to see Luciano. But they were kept in the dark. Well, I went to the cell and got him. He went right along. I brought him up to the, to the room and thought I was going in with him, but they didn't want me to know what the agreement was, so I, I stayed outside. I thought it was unusual, but they didn't. They, they, I thought that just coming from school down to Wallkill, I thought that he was my responsibility and I should stay with him. When he got through with him, let him out, and I took him back to cell. He didn't talk about it on the way back. He didn't talk anyway much. He was special. He had a little bit of with somebody. They were there, hopefully that whatever Sox Lanza had been able to accomplish, that this could be carried to another level 
by utilizing Lucky Luciano's ability to communicate. Down on the docks, word went out that Lucky Luciano wanted the men to cooperate. Now people were willing to talk. Members of the Mafia had regular meetings with Huffington, who gave them each a code number so their names would not be revealed. The Navy now had a regular source of dock and coast information, and the Mafia could congratulate themselves on helping the war effort. But at the same time they were cooperating with the Navy, they had developed a nice black market sideline that was anything but patriotic. Rationing was now everywhere, and most Americans were gladly doing their bit for the war effort. One for you and one for me. It's as clear as ABC. Share alike for victory. Get the point, Mrs. Brown. But the patriotic atmosphere of the country did not stop Luciano's associates from profiting from the war. At the Office of Price Administration, which distributed ration stamps, Mafia entrepreneur Carlo Gambino figured out a way to steal the stamps and made huge profits. Gambino would resell them. In one sale alone, he cleared a million dollars. The stamps also enabled the Mafia to buy sought-after goods like meat, sugar, and fuel, which could be resold for good profit. In addition, this racket meant that the Mafia restaurants and clubs were always well supplied with choice meat and other items, while other Americans did without. The Navy knew they were dealing with criminals, but they were more concerned with influencing the outcome of the war. In early 1943, the tide of fortune was beginning to turn, and the Allies started preparing to attack the enemy on his own land. Their first target would be Sicily. Operation Underworld took on a new importance. Luciano's men were asked to find Italians who could be trusted and bring them to meet Commander Haffenden at Naval Intelligence Headquarters at 90 Church Street. There, the Navy pulled out large maps and asked their guests to identify villages and harbors and enemy installations. People were sent in to me. I never ask names, you never do in this type of work. If they had information, I began to plot it in on my maps. July 10, 1943, the invasion of Sicily, codenamed Operation Husky, began. The information from the underworld proved invaluable, and the Allies swept through Sicily. As they occupied the island, they sought out Sicilian leaders who could take over the local government. They wanted anti-fascists and people opposed to communism. In the end, many of those they appointed turned out to be mafia leaders, the so-called local men of respect. The mafiosi became interpreters for the Allies. Many dons even became town mayors. Vito Genovese, Luciano's former New York underboss who had fled a murder charge in the U.S., was appointed an official translator at U.S. Army headquarters. His position helped him set up the Italian black market, selling American military supplies and using U.S. trucks to transport them around Italy. Inadvertently, the U.S. was giving the Mafia an enormous boost. Back at Great Meadows, Lucky Luciano followed the events with growing anticipation. He covered a wall of his cell with a map of Europe and marked on it the Allied advances as they inched toward Berlin. He hoped that the final defeat of Hitler would mean more than the end of the war. He hoped it would bring his freedom. The war in Europe finally ended on May 7, 1945. Nobody was happier than Lucky Luciano. On that same day, he sent a petition for executive clemency to Governor Dewey. On a cold February morning in 1946, Luciano was taken to the SS Laura Keen. The government had agreed to send him back to Italy as a reward for his wartime services, but he was forbidden to return. As the rusty wartime troop carrier passed the Statue of Liberty, Luciano felt dismay. He later said, When the pilot horn started to blow, the sound of it seemed to fill the inside of my belly. The only other time that I had this kind of experience was when the gates closed behind me up at Danamora. 
The departure of Luciano by no means signaled the demise of the Mafia. With the war over, America was ready for fun, and the mob was ready to supply it. Horse racing, gambling, and spending money became an American pastime once again. Frank Costello, Bugsy Siegel, Joe Adonis, and Meyer Lansky opened fancy gambling houses in Louisiana, California, and Florida. They took over horse tracks, dog tracks, bookie joints, and the wire services. This meant that the outcome of a horse race could be known well in advance of an official announcement. The bookies could then create the odds, and the mob would rake in huge profits on every single race. The Mafia's wire service on the West Coast was being run by Bugsy Siegel. Siegel was doing well for the mob, and was respected and trusted by them. His high-profile charm even made them seem somewhat legitimate. In reality, he was a shrewd gangster with a feverish temper, and was known to kill simply because he didn't like his nickname. Nobody there called him Bugsy. You either called him Benny or Mr. Siegel. The, the word was, was around that if you ever call him Bugsy, you had to be a dear friend of his that you knew him well, otherwise you were, in, you were in trouble. Bugsy's personal ambitions were growing. He saw money in the desert, in the undeveloped town of Las Vegas. Gambling had been legal in Las Vegas since 1931, and the casinos, already owned by the New York mob, turned good profits. But they resembled saloons, and to Bugsy, they were small time. His dream was to bring the glamour and sophistication of Hollywood to the frontier of Las Vegas. When I arrived in Las Vegas, 16 year old, 1931, the town was approximately 4,000 people. They had five paved streets going from Main Street to Las Vegas Boulevard, and they had about six paved streets going from Fremont down to either Bonneville or Gas. The rest of the town was dirt streets. In 1945, Bugsy looked at the biggest hotels in town, the El Rancho and the Frontier Club, and decided he wanted something even grander. His opportunity came when he discovered a plan for a casino hotel to be named the Flamingo. He raised money from Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, and scores of other investors. He had to beg and borrow. Some say he even had to steal. The project seemed headed for success until Bugsy started making expensive changes. He wanted larger hotel rooms and demanded the most expensive materials, including fine wood and marble. The costs rocketed. Another problem came in the form of his mistress, Virginia Hill, a beautiful southern showgirl who had transformed herself into a femme fatale. She had a special knack for latching onto mobsters and their money. Bugsy installed her as chief overseer of the Flamingo's construction. She was a beautiful girl, thought she was God's gift to everybody in the world. She was very egotistical, but, but uh, she wasn't a dummy. She was a smart girl. Was, she didn't ask for anything that, uh, that he didn't give her if she wanted it. But nobody trusted her. Some mobsters suspected that Virginia Hill was skimming money from the hotel construction. The reality was that the Flamingo was becoming a financial drain. Bugsy's checks began to bounce. Desperate, he sold the same shares to different buyers several times over. Costello, Luciano, and Lansky began to grumble. Where was their money going? How was Bugsy going to finish the Flamingo if he kept making changes? But Bugsy wasn't in the mood to listen. He was rough, and he was gruff, and he was moody and temperamental, and when he wasn't slapping uh, Virginia Hill, she was slapping him, and it was all public. There was another reason why the Mafia was becoming disillusioned with Bugsy. It had to do with control of the wire services. The mob owned the wire services in Chicago, Florida, Nevada, and Arizona. But in California, Siegel wanted it all for himself. The situation with Bugsy called for consultation at the highest level. In December 1946, the National Commission called a meeting in Cuba. It was so important that Lucky Luciano broke the terms of his deportation in order to preside. All the bosses were there. They discussed the division of the casino gambling spoils, the drug trade, and what to do with Bugsy. Meyer Lansky, his friend from their Lower East Side gang days, apparently pleaded for an extension to give Siegel more time. They agreed to wait until the Flamingo opened. 
It finally opened the day after Christmas, 1946. By this time, it had cost more than six million dollars, five million over budget. You couldn't get in with a shoehorn. They had a ton of Hollywood personalities up here, and they had a big gamblers up here. It was, it was really jammed. The Flamingo opened with great fanfare, but it was a bust, in spite of the support of entertainers like Jimmy Durante and George Raft. The house lost big the first night and continued to lose throughout the next month. In late January, after being open for less than a month, the Flamingo closed its doors. Bugsy begged for more money to complete the hotel rooms. Lansky and Costello gave him one last chance. In March 1947, the Flamingo reopened, and Bugsy was there day after day greeting customers with his charm. He was ever hopeful, and in fact, this time, the Flamingo did turn a profit. But his mismanagement and his greed over the wire service meant that he had lost the confidence of his fellow gangsters. I think they thought he was getting too big. He was probably answering the guys back that were putting up the money. Or The story is that they thought there was, that he had stolen money uh, or, you know, siphoned it off or let the cost overruns go. I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, it certainly could be true, but they thought he maybe he was getting too big. Or maybe he was trying to divorce himself from them, I don't know. On June 20th, 1947, Bugsy was alone at Virginia Hill's home in Beverly Hills. She had taken off after a characteristically bad quarrel. Bugsy was reading the Los Angeles Times when the first bullet hit him. The assassin had rested his gun on the windowsill and he pumped a volley of bullets into Bugsy's body. The blood flowed over Virginia's chintz sofa. Bugsy's left eye was completely blown out and was found on the other side of the room against the wall. More bullets crushed the bridge of his nose and shattered a vertebrae in the back of his neck. The night that Bugsy Siegel was killed in Beverly Hills, almost at midnight, Gus Greenbaum and a man named Mo Sedway walked into the Flamingo Hotel and said, we were the new owners, and they were. And that started, and then they turned it around and made it into a giant. The Flamingo was known worldwide. And that's the legacy of the town. And it can't be just Gus Greenbaum or Mo Dalitz, and there are no individual heroes. It was, if it's heroic at all. I mean, it was done by organized crime. The death of Bugsy was a cruel reminder of the violent laws that governed the Mafia. Bugsy's dream would eventually become a reality. The Flamingo would flourish, and Las Vegas would bloom like a flower in the desert. Building Las Vegas was no easy task. But the Mafia was the toughest of corporations, whether it was bootlegging, protection rackets on the docks, or gambling. They knew how to run a business. In Las Vegas, the Mafia had found a city where gambling was legal. And finally, they could walk on the right side of the law. I'm Bill Curtis.